Acts chapter 4. I encourage you to follow along with us in this passage this morning. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one in the back of the pew in front of you. If you don't have one at home, we encourage you to take that home with you. That's our gift to you. Um, We've been going through uh, this series in the book of Acts uh, called Unleashing the Spirit. Today we're going to talk about the uncontainable Christ, the uncontainable Christ. Let me pray one more time and then we'll get started this morning. King Jesus, thank you again for this opportunity to be here. Indeed, Lord, we've come to hear from the living God. And so we say, speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see what the Spirit speaks to the churches. Help us, God, to learn from uh, the early church, from these early Christians, God, who were walking in courageous faith and obedience to you. God, help us to walk in the fullness of your Holy Spirit. God, open our mouths to speak words of life. God, into um, a world, God, that's full of darkness and death. Lord, we need you this morning. So speak to us, transform us, convict us of sin. God, uh, encourage us in our, strengthen our weaknesses. God, encourage us in our um, suffering. Uh, And God, help us, God, to live lives of bold faith for you. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So we're going to continue through the book of Acts. And we're seeing how Jesus unleashed the Holy Spirit. How he poured out that Spirit on the day of Pentecost. uh, And that the Spirit is empowering his church for this impossible mission, right, of making disciples uh, to the ends of the earth uh, in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit fell. Uh, They proclaimed uh, the uh, glory of God and his work through Jesus Christ in unlearned languages, and 3,000 Jews got saved that day. And over the past couple weeks, we've been uh, walking through this account of how Peter and John healed this man who was born lame from birth outside the temple. And, you know, everybody recognized him and and knew who he was. And uh, uh, this this healing just is obviously miraculous, right? And obviously God has done that to validate and to verify the message that those apostles uh, came to proclaim, that in Jesus is resurrection from the dead, forgiveness of sins, um, and and, and everlasting life. Uh, And it's not surprising then that uh, this this crowd that that gathered together caused quite a stir uh, within the temple, and so because of that, uh, the, all of this gets the attention of the re- the religious leaders and the religious elite and the high priests, and they come to investigate what is going on in our passage today. But Peter has a message for them too, a message of the Christ that death cannot hold down, a message of the uncontainable Christ from Acts chapter four beginning in verse 1. If you're able and willing, let me invite you to stand and honor the reading of God's Word. We're going to read from Acts chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. It says, And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power Or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, then let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. And they recognized 
that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all of the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom, on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. The word of God. You may be seated. Okay, so we're looking at this message, Peter's message to the religious leaders who are greatly annoyed uh, because he's proclaiming the resurrection from the dead through Jesus Christ in the temple, and thousands of people uh, have gotten saved, okay, and they don't like this because they're not in charge. And so we're going to look at this passage, uh, his message here under uh, five uh, points this morning. Uh, Number one, the annoying witness. The annoying witness. Number two, the unstoppable word. Number three, the uncontainable Christ. Number four, the exclusive message. And the number five, the undaunted heart. The annoying witness, unstoppable witness, unstoppable word, uncontainable Christ, the exclusive message, number four, and the undaunted heart. Okay, so first, we're going to talk about the annoying witness. So Peter proclaimed the gospel, right? He proclaimed this message to the amazed crowd, uh, preaching that it is not they, but that it is Jesus who healed this uh, man who was lame from birth. Uh, Jesus is able to do this despite the fact that Jesus was crucified in that very city just months earlier. All right, Jesus is able to do that because Jesus is, in fact, alive and well. Because God raised him from the dead. And he ascended to the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And from there, Jesus is alive, reigning from on high, through which he is able to heal this man through his servants, Peter and John. And so, and so, uh, the fact that Jesus is alive and well, reigning from this very, at this very moment, even this very day, right, has some significant theological implications for your life and for mine. Uh, the, not, and not the least of which being that uh, Jesus' resurrection proves that there is a resurrection, and it guarantees that all who hope in him have the future hope of bodily resurrection from the dead. This is a, this is a brute Christian fact Uh, That uh, may sound amazing, but it is true. One day, everybody will rise from the dead and give account to God for what we did with the life that he gave us. Now, it says there that the religious leaders were were part of the Sadducean party, okay? The Sadducees are kind of like the elite, wealthy, aristocratic, ruling class uh, of, of the Jews, okay? And most of the high priestly families who obviously were very important um, in the Jewish world, uh, were part of the Sadducean party. Now, they are greatly annoyed uh, for many reasons, uh, not the least of which being that the Sadducees do not, did not believe in the bodily resurrection. So there were, you know, two main parties that we hear about a lot in J- Judaism at that time, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection, uh, and in that sense they agreed with Jesus and Christianity, but the Sadducee, the Sadducee party did not believe in the resurrection from the dead. Okay? And so they're, uh, they're, they, believe, they emphasized the Torah or the first five books of the Bible and didn't really believe in the rest. All right? And so uh, and they're, they're mostly the ruling elite priestly class. All right? So the temple, the temple was kind of their turf. And so, the, and so they have these kind of <laughs> Galilean redneck, you know, nobodies here who have created a massive stir preaching things that they disagree with on their turf, okay? In other words, they're not happy, all right? They're annoyed, all right? And so they arrest them but decide to keep them in custody till the next day because it's pretty late in the day at this point, so they arrest them and keep them in custody till the next day till they can investigate and interrogate them, okay? So what's the lesson here? The lesson is that the apostles weren't going around looking for a fight. They weren't going around try, trying to be annoying, but, but they were going to worship at the temple as they did with the other Christians 
and they saw this man born lame, and, and we talked about how it seems that Peter just, in, in the Holy Spirit, just knew that God wanted to do something for this man, and so uh, he, Jesus heals him, and, and uh, he's leaping and jumping. He was born lame from birth. This creates this incredible occasion to proclaim the gospel to these crowds who are amazed at what has happened. So they weren't looking to be annoying, but God had given them, Jesus had given them a mission to proclaim, to be, their, to be his witnesses beginning in Jerusalem, right? So people needed this message. God himself was confirming this message through the signs that they were performing, right? They were doing exactly what God wanted them to do, and they got arrested for it. So this is just, you, you know, another friendly reminder that when, when, when you obey Jesus, don't be surprised if it gets you in trouble, okay? Because a lot of people get that backwards. They, they feel like, oh, if something hard happens or if they end up in a challenging situation, they must have done something wrong. And I just want to say that's not always true. In fact, in many cases, it's false. In, in many cases, you might get in trouble because you actually did the right thing. Okay? And so this is what is happening to them. When you talk about this is just, this, if you haven't figured this out yet, this is only be, going to become more and more of the case. And I'm, and I'm suggesting that we as Christians should just get used to it. When you talk about Jesus, it's going to annoy some people. That's just reality. Right? Now, you shouldn't try to be annoying. You shouldn't, you shouldn't go out there with the intention of being annoying. But the truth is, is that when you talk about Jesus, it's going to annoy some people. All right? But, 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 but guess what? When God has given you a mission to do, right, if your doctor tells you that, hey, you, you, you need to get your health together. You need to, you need to start exercising. You need, to, you need to, you know, start eating a little better. That may annoy you, but he's trying to save your life. You see what I'm saying? We may get, people may get annoyed by us, but you know what? If you're trying to eternally help their souls, then you got to do what you got to do, all right? When you do what God wants you to do, somewhere out there, someone out there is not going to like it, but get, but take heart. Don't give up. Keep talking about Jesus because he is the solution to the world's problems. And what God is in, no man can stop, no matter what happens. So number one, the annoying witness. Number two, the unstoppable word. The unstoppable word in verse four there in Acts four. It says that many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. Now, now Luke is doing what? He's recording here the results that had taken place, right? We saw that 3,000 people got saved on the day of Pentecost. And now we see that it says that the number of the men reached about 5,000. Now, it's actually not clear, like, what he's saying. It's not clear if he's saying that that's 5,000 in, uh, including the, 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 the 3,000 that got saved earlier, it could actually be say, saying that 5,000 more people actually got saved that day. It's not clear. But what's the point? The point is, is that large numbers of people were coming into the household of God through the proclamation of the gospel, through the power of the Holy Spirit, as confirmed by the signs that these, that these apostles were doing. And so, in other words, the fact that, that at least 2,000 or up to 5,000 more people got saved at this, at this occasion, when Peter and John are, are preaching the gospel, shows that the word is unstoppable. The word's unstoppable. The word of God, so listen guys, God created the universe with a word. You understand what I'm saying? God's word is going to do what God wants his word to do. So, when you proclaim the word of God to other people, guess what? It, God's going to work. God's going to act. No one can stop it, right? The religious leaders just months before thought that if they just crucified Jesus, they could actually end that whole movement, you know, and they would that, get, get Jesus out of their hair and everything would be fine. Though, of course, the problem was that was that was actually all part of God's plan because Jesus was going to rise from the dead and be even more annoying than before because he was going to pour out his Holy Spirit and send out his followers into the world who would keep proclaiming his message so that people would keep getting saved, and that's what happened. And so it actually, it actually, <laughs> it actually exacerbated the problem from their perspective than, than, uh, than if Jesus was still alive. So in other words, sin can't stop the word. Satan can't stop the word. The government can't stop the word. In fact, the harder the world, the flesh, and the devil try to stop the Word of God, the more it tends to grow. In fact, uh, uh, an ancient church father, Tertullian, uh, wrote this one time. He said, he said, the oftener we are mown down by you, the more in number we grow. The blood of Christians 
is seed. And that's where we get the famous saying um, that uh, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And so in other words, the word of God can't lose, the word of God can't be stopped. Jesus has already won, Jesus has already conquered, all right? And just not, the only problem is not everybody realizes that. But, but this, is, this is my point. There's no need, don't, don't be ashamed of something that's unstoppable. Why would you quit a battle that you know you're, gu- you're guaranteed to win? So why would we give up in our mission, in our task, to keep sharing Jesus with other people? The Word is still working. The Word's going to keep working until Jesus comes back. And so let's keep compla- co- uh, proclaiming it. So the annoying witness, the unstoppable Word. Number three, the uncontainable cry. The uncontainable cry. So the rulers there in, act, in verses 5 and following, right, uh, you know, question them, by what power, by what name have you done this? And, and Peter's like, well, if you're questioning us about a good deed that we did to a crippled man, uh, we want you to know that it's Jesus who healed this man, uh, and this is the same Jesus that you crucified, verse 10, whom God raised from the dead. It's by Jesus that this man is standing before you well. And then he says that Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone, verse 11. Okay, so they finally get Peter and John, and apparently the, the, the healed man there, too. He, apparently, they arrested him, too, which is kind of weird, all right? But they got these, these three guys, and they're interrogating them in the Sanhedrin, which was kind of like a, the, the, the ultimate uh, authoritative body within, within Judaism, all right? And apparently, the, the Sanhedrin met in a semicircle-type setup, and so when it says that he had them in their, in their midst, it probably just means that they were literally like in the middle of them because, and they were kind of circled around them, all right? And they ask him, by what power or by what name did you do this? And so the question, I, th- I think it involves, you know, b- two things. They're asking both about the healing and about the preaching. You know, by what power and by what authority did you do the healing and by what power and what authority are you doing this preaching, all right? Because power, the idea of power often encompasses both the capability of doing something and the authority to do something, all right? Peter and John claimed that this man was healed by the name of Jesus, by the name of Jesus. In other words, by Jesus himself. So Jesus has both the power and the authority to heal a man lame from birth. The leaders, of course, are are concerned about power and authority, because they believe that the temple precincts are within their power and authority, and they don't like anything going on in there that they don't that they didn't approve of. All right, so they so their child. So the question here is a question of authority. By what authority are you doing this? By what authority are you stirring up these crowds? By what authority did you heal this this man? By what by what power and authority is this taking place? All right, they're concerned that their own authority is is being challenged, and that these uh. Uh, Galilean ragamuffins have call, came up and stirred this big old crowd. But Peter gets up, and it says there that he's filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, remember what Jesus told them before uh, he was crucified and resurrected and ascended, right? Jesus said that you will be arrested for my name's sake, but don't worry about what you're going to say because the Holy Spirit will give you the words to say at that time. Well, Peter and them and John are arrested. And by the way, like, just to be clear, right, like, these are, these, the people that they are in front of is the same group of people that murdered Jesus just a, 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 month, a month or two before. So literally, they know that how they respond to this group of people could literally cost them their life, right? So this isn't like a, you know, oh, I, I, I hope it kind of works out kind of thing. Them basically just kind of, sh- <laughs> just kind of, just, you know, put, throwing it right back at them is Peter basically saying, I'm ready to die, if that's what God calls me to. But that's exactly what he does, right? It says he's filled with the Holy Spirit, okay? And to be clear, right, every believer is filled with the Holy Spirit. But in Acts, we see that there are times where it says uh, that, that certain people are, are kind of, uh, it's a fresh feeling of the Holy Spirit, typically associated with the empowerment to boldly proclaim the gospel. So the, when the, the, the primary way in Acts that it talks about Christians being filled with the Holy Spirit is we are filled with the Holy Spirit with boldness and courage to speak the Word of God boldly to those who need to hear it, okay? So if you want fullness of the Holy Spirit, that's what we're after, all right? 
And that's what happened to Peter and John. And so Peter doesn't beat around the bush. You arrested us. If you arrested us for this good deed, and I mean, he's kind of tr- he's kind of pointing out the ridiculous nature of what's happening, right? You arrested us for literally healing a guy like we didn't do anything wrong, right? We did this good deed to this crippled man, but I want you to know that it was Jesus of Nazareth, the man of God that you yourselves plotted against and crucified. It's by him that this man is made well. God has raised him from the dead, and it's by his power that this man stands before you whole. And then he cites... <clears throat> He cites one of, uh, one of the most uh, cited Old Testament verses in the New Testament, and that is Psalm 118.22, right, which, which says that the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, all right? And so the builders of Israel are like the leaders, and that includes the Sanhedrin and the ruling class, all right? But they rejected Jesus, but God has made Jesus the cornerstone of his entire people. In other words, they tried to make Jesus nothing, but God made Jesus everything. That's what happens when you try to oppose God. It just doesn't work, right? It doesn't work. They tried to kill him, but death had no hold on him. Jesus is alive and well, so plotting and scheming can't stop Jesus. Crucifixion can't stop Jesus. A death can't stop Jesus. Uh, Christ is uncontainable, and he's just getting started. Christ is uncontainable, and he's just getting started. You realize that this, this right here is like, it's, it's the beginning. It's the seed. It's the seed of the church. The gospel had to go first to Jerusalem and then Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We are literally sitting right here 2,000 years later, thousands of miles away from Jerusalem. You know, you can hop on a plane and go there. It's still there, all right? And guess what? We're worshiping Jesus as resurrected and reigning. Why? Because, because you can't stop Jesus. And he's going to keep going, and the gospel is going to be, keep being proclaimed to the ends of the earth until the appointed day when he comes back. So it's the uncontainable Christ, number three. Next, number four, we see the exclusive message. The exclusive message. One of the most famous verses in Scripture, uh, Acts 4.12. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And so we just sang earlier, right? Holy, there is no one like you. All right, open up our eyes and wonder, right? Uh, Jesus' name healed this man, and that is the proof, the vindication that Jesus is who he said he was, that he alone is God's chosen servant, that he alone is God's appointed king, that he alone is the heir of David, the promised seed of Abraham, the skull crusher who will grind Satan's head into the ground. Uh, Jesus is unique of all human beings. He alone is the the virgin-born Son of God, uh, the one appointed by God to seek and to save the lost, and that in His name and in His name alone is forgiveness of sins, reconciliation with God, and resurrection and eternal life. Uh, Jesus is unique of all people, so He is uniquely the only one, the only name by which we can be saved, the one and only Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. For this reason, then, salvation is found in no one else. Salvation is found in no one else. Salvation is found in Jesus alone because there is no one like Jesus. That's just, that's, that's just simply what it boils down to, right? And so what's the point today? The point today is that everybody is looking for salvation from something, right? Everybody is looking for salvation in something, right? People are looking, you know, to uh, the Jews, for example, were looking to uh, the law, all right, the, the, the pagans at that time were looking to their plethora of, uh, of Greek and Roman gods and deities, okay? Uh, people today are looking for salvation uh, in money. If I just have enough money, I'll be happy. Or relationships, if I can just find the right person, I'll be happy. Or, or even their children or their, or, their, or their influence among their peers or whatever it is, whatever you're looking to, to fill that void in your heart to... to to whatever you're looking to to say I matter or that or that or that or to or to deal with that problem of guilt or shame or whatever it is, whatever you're looking to to bring you complete happiness, that is your God. That is your idol. That is what you're looking to to save you, to deliver you. All right? But the Bible says that there's only one who can save. And his name is Jesus. And this is where religious pluralism breaks down because you know for a long time we were told things like, well, you know, all religions are basically the same and they all teach these same basic things. But the truth is, that's just not true, right? 
because let's just take the, the, you know, the three major monotheistic religions, Christianity, Muslims, and, uh, Islam, and Judaism. Well, guess what? All three of those religions disagree on who Jesus is. Well, newsflash, who Jesus is is literally the centerpiece of the Christian religion. So if we can't agree on that, then guess what? We don't teach the same things. All right? It's not even close. Right? So all religions are not the same. All religions don't believe, aren't teaching the same things. All right? Either Jesus is who he said he is and was, or he's not. If he is, he is worthy of com- complete and total faith and love and trust and obedience and surrender. If he's not, he's not even worth thinking about. And so, and so either Christianity is true or it's not. Peter stands in line with his own Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, who he himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And, and so just to be clear, right, this bothers, the exclusive nature of Christianity bothers some people. Uh, and I just think we have to realize that that's just because of this uh, relativistic air that we breathe and a lack of critical thinking. Because here's the point. Everybody, not just Christians, are exclusive. All right? That's just a brute fact, right? If you say there are many ways to heaven, then by definition, you are excluding the claim that there is one way to heaven. Right? You're exclusive. All right? Uh, To say anything is true is by definition to say that there are other things that are false. All right? You're being exclusive. If you say that there is no such thing as truth, well, my question is, is it true that there are no such thing as, that there's no such thing as truth? In other words, everybody's exclusive. So the question is not who's going to be exclusive. The question is, what is the truth? I don't know about you, but I want to know the truth. Peter said, salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. If you want to live a frustrating life, here's how you do it. You look your entire life for something in the places where it can't be found. That's a frustrating life. Everybody is looking for salvation. And the reason why so many people just feel frustrated and burdened and tired and just meaninglessness is because they keep looking in the place where it can't be found. I'm telling you that what you are looking for is found in Jesus and in Jesus alone. Significance, meaning, forgiveness, removal of guilt, removal of shame, removal, uh, addressing, looking you in the eye, knowing all of your faults and all of your sins and all of your shortcomings and loving you anyways and filling you with his spirit so that you can change and be transformed to become the person you know you were made to be. That and that alone is found in Jesus and in no one else. It's the exclusive message. You know, if a, if, if, if a, re- if a research uh, lab came out and they said, we found the cure to cancer, you know what wouldn't happen? People wouldn't be saying, oh my gosh, we only have one cure for cancer. Can't believe it. No, people would say, thank God there is one cure for cancer. There is one cure for the disease of sin. It's one more cure than we deserve. And his name is Jesus Christ. So the exclusive message, number four. Finally, number five, the undaunted heart. The undaunted heart. In in verses 13 and following there of Acts chapter 4, you know, they're opposing him and they're trying to figure out what they're going to do. They don't know what to do because this man has clearly been healed, right? And we got nothing to say to that. You can't refute that. He's literally standing right there being healed, right? Everybody knows who he is, all right? We, we can't refute that, right? And so all that we can do is to threaten them and tell them, guys, you just can't, you can't, you can't speak in the name of Jesus anymore. And Peter just straight up says, look, guys, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you have to judge. But we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. So these rulers, right, they're amazed that these, you know, redneck, uneducated, common men spoke 
with authority and boldness. They lacked the formal training. You know, they didn't go to seminary, all right? They didn't have a, they didn't have a college degree, all right? They weren't trained theological experts. They were laymen, all right? But there was one critical difference, and that is that they looked at these guys and they remembered, they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Now, if you remember, right, Jesus received the same critique, right, when Jesus preached, right? People looked at Jesus, they looked at Jesus, and they were like, well, how does this guy have all this learning? Because he's never studied, and he's from Galilee, you know? Like, it, but, but they were astonished at the authority with which he spoke, right? And now that, his, now that Jesus has ascended, and he's sending his disciples out, right, they're amazed in the same way about them as they were about Jesus. But see, if you think about it, right, the, the Peter and John, they really weren't unschooled. They really weren't unschooled. They literally had the best teacher in the entire universe. They were taught by Jesus. They weren't unschooled. They weren't untrained. They just didn't have a traditional education. They were taught by Jesus. They, got, they took their cues from Jesus. And let me tell you something. When you've been with Jesus, when you've learned from Jesus, when you take your cues from Jesus, people will know. People will recognize it. All right, and so the point is, is that they, that they can't refute this fact, all right, but Peter just says, look, we've got to obey God rather than men. That's basically what it boils down to, and so as we wrap it up this morning, this is the question that, that, that Peter and John were faced to answer, and this is the question that we all are faced to answer, our church and you in particular. Will we be a church that fundamentally listens to man or listens to God? Will you be a Christian that fundamentally listens to man or to God? Will you be an employee? Will you be a parent? Will you be whatever your role is? Will you be in every sphere of your life somebody who listens to God or listens to man? You know, I've been thinking a lot about this recently, but there's lots of, uh, there's lots of, uh, there's lots of scripts out there in the world, right? Maybe when you were growing up, your parents had a script that they wanted you to follow. All right? X, Y, and Z. All right? Well, in this world today, right, people out there, it, everybody has a script for you to follow. It's kind of like, you ever heard that saying? It's like, um, uh, if you don't control your time, if you, if, if you don't take care of your time, someone else will take care of it for you, right? All right? Someone else, if you don't, if you don't know what you want to do, someone else will give you something to do. All right? Well, the, so my question is, whose script are we following? Are we following the script that our Lord Jesus has for us? Because the religious leaders, they had a different script for Peter and John. They said, no, 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 you've got this thing wrong. You, you've, you've messed this up. You need to follow our script. You don't need to talk about Jesus. And Peter and John just simply say, look, whether you think it's rather to, better to obey God rather than you, that's for you to judge. But all I'm saying is I'm following Jesus' script for my life. And so that's the question. Are we going to follow man or are we going to follow God? Who are we listening to? So let's be like John. Let's be like Peter. Let's walk in the Holy Spirit and have the undaunted heart. Let's pray together. King Jesus, Lord, you are alive. You are reigning from heaven. And uh, and Lord, we admit that we all stumble, God, in many ways. But I believe, I confess, for most of the people in this room, that we want to be, this morning, like Peter and John. We want to be those who can look the world, the flesh, and the devil in the eye and say, you know what? I'm not going to listen to you. I'm going to listen to God. I'm going to listen to my King Jesus. I'm going to listen to my Savior. And so, Lord, help us today. Help us to not, help us to not be afraid. Lord, even if our witness is uh, sometimes annoying, God, Um, We have the unstoppable word. We belong to the uncontainable Christ. Lord, so give us, we pray, undaunted hearts. Let us not be afraid to trust in you. Let us not be afraid to speak to you, for you. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, that we might be bold for your name's sake. And it's in Christ's name we pray.